for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Paws. Welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. My name is Darren Gibson. I'm your host today. We have got a lot to talk about today. We have some updates to some stories we've told you about in the past. A small town right by where I grew up is in the national news and not for a very good reason. Plus, I want to tell you about what I've done the last two weeks that I've been gone and... Three Hammer Time winners this week, and I'm going to be roasting some people. I don't care if I lose listeners, friends, stations. I don't care. I'm going to tell the truth no matter what. Period. End of story. You'll find out when we get to our Hammer Time segment, so... Before we get started with today's show, a couple of reminders. You can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash South Paws Radio Show. You can follow us on Twitter at South Paws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at South Paws Radio Show.tumblr.com. You can follow us on YouTube by doing a search for South Paws Radio. And you can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash South Paws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime at Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, Podvine, and Pandora by doing a search for South Paws. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and YouTube accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern. And you can listen to us on great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico, KZGM in Kabul, Missouri, and KEPJ in San Antonio, Texas. So be sure to listen to us on your local Pacifica station. So what have I been doing the last couple of weeks? Well, I should probably fill you all in on something that I participated in for about a week in New York City. Several months ago, I was watching the Today Show, and they were talking about a study for clinical depression. Now, as many of you know, I have suffered from mental health disorders for a number of years, including depression, anxiety, PTSD. I've suffered for most of the last 30 years, and I've been needing relief. I have been to therapy I have been on a myriad of medications which either don't work or they work and they cause other side effects like weight gain, which depressed me even more. So I saw this story on the Today Show about magnetic treatment for depression. This study is called the SAINT study. It stands for Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy for treatment-resistant depression, SAINT-TRD. So how does this study work? I'm just going to read from the website clinicaltrials.gov, and this really gives a great detail on the study. It says, This study evaluates an accelerated schedule of theta burst stimulation using a transcranial magnetic stimulation device for treatment-resistant depression. In a double-blind fashion, half the participants will receive accelerated theta burst stimulation, while half will receive sham treatment. And this happened from May of 2021 to May of 2022. So this went on for a year. There were 30 participants in the trial, and it was randomized. The approved method for treatment is 10 hertz stimulation for 40 minutes over the left dorsal prefrontal cortex. This methodology has been effective in real-world situations. The limitations of this approach include the duration of the treatment, approximately 40 minutes per treatment session, five days per week for four to eight weeks. 
Recently, researchers have pursued modifying the treatment parameters to reduce treatment times with some preliminary successes. This study aims to further modify the parameters to create a more rapid form of the treatment and look at the change in neuroimaging biomarkers. So the original study that I heard about on the Today Show involved 17 people. This was the original study that Stanford University in California did. One person dropped out of the study, leaving 16 people. Those 16 people all got the treatment. There was no double blind, there was no placebo. Of those 16 people, they reported a 90% reduction in symptoms within the first week. And it stayed at 60% reduction of symptoms after four weeks. So I've heard about this, and I really wanted to be part of this study. I sure wasn't going out to Stanford, but I did contact them, and I found out that another study was happening at Cornell University in New York State. So I contacted the researchers at Cornell. I officially applied. I went through a battery of questions over a Zoom call, and they asked about what I have used to treat depression over the years, and I told them, and they asked how long I've been depressed and everything else, and I was surprised that they allowed me into the study. Very happily surprised. Because I'll just be truthful here, to me, this is the last resort. I have suffered with depression for nearly all of my adult life, and I'm tired of it. I'm mentally tired. I'm physically tired. I can't do it anymore. I need a treatment. I need it now. So when they accepted me to the study, I had to make reservations. I was able to get lodging through a hotel owned by New York Presbyterian Hospital. I'm very thankful for that because I was a participant in the study. I got a better rate on room. I also got a better rate on parking. Let me tell you, New York City is expensive, very expensive. So the study took place. I actually had to go to New York a couple of days before the study to do two things. One was to get a blood draw so they could examine the blood work. And the second was to get an MRI. Now, I should probably let everybody know that in 1988, when I was 19 years old, almost 20, that I had back surgery to correct scoliosis. The scoliosis surgery involved the implantation of two metal rods in my back with a whole bunch of hooks. They took bone chips out of my hip and fused the spine together from transverse 4 to lumbar 3 which if you know anything about the spine, that's a good long distance. The curves of my spine were really, really bad. So it was either get them fixed or eventually die from having my rib cage collapse on my lungs and my heart. So I had the surgery done. And back then, there was no such thing as MRI. There really wasn't. MRIs were just starting to come on board Doctors were not really concerned with the type of metal that they used. So in my case, I believe they used stainless steel. However, the problem now becomes stainless steel is magnetic. So guess what has happened? I went to get the MRI, and they asked, did you have surgeries? I said, yes, I had Harrington rods put in my back. Well, when? 1988. You know what they're made of? No, I don't. I, do you have any of the paperwork? No, I don't. That was 30 years ago, 34 years ago. So I contacted my old orthopedic surgeon's office. He has since retired. They don't keep those records more than seven years in the state of Michigan. I contacted the hospital. The hospital that did the surgery keeps the records three times the state minimum, 21 years. But they didn't have my records because it had been more than 21 years ago since I had it. So we took a chance, and they said, well, come on anyway. If you can't get the MRI, we'll figure out what to do next. So after the blood draw, I walked down the street several blocks to where the MRI was located. And the technician 
immediately took a security wand that they use to check for guns and knives and whatever on you, and he went up and down my back, and it started beeping like crazy. And he said, I don't want to do the MRI on you. Let me consult with somebody else that's here. So they did the consult. He said, sorry, you can't have it because we use a three Tesla strength MRI. Most hospitals use a one and a half Tesla strength MRI. So because of that, they were afraid that the metal in my back would heat up. They were also afraid of loosening something in my body. One and a half Tesla's fine, but not three. So I could not get the MRI. I thought I wasn't going to get the treatment. They made an exception for me, and I got the treatment. So here's what happened. On the first day of treatment, I went into the clinic, and they started taking measurements of my skull. They took several different measurements. They left the room. They came back with a cap. It was a plain white cap that they put over my skull, and then they took more measurements and started marking areas on the cap. By the time I was done, they pretty much had a map of where they were going to put the device and how far my cap needed to be from the bridge of my nose. So they've got this all figured out. Once I had the cap on and secure, I then went to another room where they did the treatments. Now, the treatment consisted of me laying in what looked like a dentist chair. So they took this device at a 45-degree angle and placed it on my skull. Well, first they had to map out how strong the device could be because they wanted to use the minimum amount of strength possible. So they took an electromagnet coil and they put it over the center of my head, and they would hit it at so much power to see if my right hand would jump or make an involuntary movement. They did this several times. They figured out how strong of a pulse was needed to get my hand to move. The computer then automatically did the calculations and told the researchers what strength magnet to use on the uh, SAINT study. So they took this electromagnet and they put it on my head and secured it in place and then it would slowly go up at first to the threshold that was needed. Once it hit the threshold, it would send pulses, and it would send 10 pulses every 10 seconds. Each chain of 10 pulses was called a train. I would get six trains, which six times 10 is 60, 60 pulses in a minute, and treatment went for 10 minutes. So I would sit there for 10 minutes, with 600 pulses going through my head. And this happened every 55 minutes. So once I got done in the chair, I would go back to my own little private room in the clinic where I could take a nap, I could read books, I could play on my phone, have snacks, whatever. I could also leave if I wanted to to get something to eat as long as I was back by the time that the next round of treatment was happening. And they sent me a schedule. And I got to tell you, the staff there were absolutely wonderful. So I want to give a shout out to the folks at Wild Cornelius. Uh, the actual people that uh, helped do the treatment, Nick, Rebecca, Megan, and Haley. And though they're just a fantastic group of uh, young people that are really helping to try and help others that are suffering from treatment-resistant depression. And the doctors would come in every day and they would ask me how I was feeling, if I had suicidal thoughts, if I had thoughts of harming myself or somebody else, if I had any side effects, headache or ringing in my ears or chattering in my teeth or disturbances in my sleep pattern, anything like that. I mean, they were very thorough with the questions that they asked me and making sure that I was safe, that I didn't have any seizures, and that I didn't have any underlying health issues that could have jeopardized it. So this went on for 10 treatments a day, so every 55 minutes. So I was there from 9 in the morning until about 5.30 in the afternoon, and I did this for five days straight, and we'll see. 
I am supposed to have a follow-up appointment with them after one week. That is supposed to take place on Friday, October 28th. We are recording this show on Thursday, October 27th, so that I can spend the time in the Zoom meeting with them for an hour and just go over what has happened since I left New York City. Now, this is my first time in New York City. Unfortunately, I didn't really get to see any of the sites or anything like that. You know, I was basically working, clocking in at 9, clocking out at 5.30. So I didn't really get to see much, and I didn't get to experience much. I will say I did get to try a Nathan's hot dog because they had a cart right by the hospital, and that was amazing. (laughs) You know, Jack's been trying to get me to eat vegetarian, and you know what? I'm sorry. I got to have my chili cheese dogs, and that they were fantastic. I did have fries there. On my last day, I actually went out for lunch instead of just having snacks in my little private room at the clinic. I actually went out and had lunch. There was a food cart down the street that was selling halal food. Of course, I got to get me some falafel while I'm in New York because I absolutely love falafel. And there's only about two places in Grand Rapids that sells it. And they're both downtown and they're both a pain in the neck to get to. So it was great. I love falafel. If anybody's got a great, you know, I mean, it's basically ground up chickpeas and formed into a ball and you deep fry them but yeah they were amazing i love it i also got to try new york style pizza for the first time i got one uh, that was a large 14 inch basically their version of a deluxe pizza that cost nearly 30 dollars but it was the most amazing pizza i have ever had it was phenomenal I also had the experience of grocery shopping while I was in New York City. The room that I stayed in, and I want to thank the folks at uh, New York Presbyterian Helmsley for allowing me to stay there. The studio that I had had a small bathroom with a shower, toilet sink, you know, usual. But I also had a small little kitchen area with a full-size fridge, microwave, oven with a stove, dishwasher i had kitchen utensils coffee pot toaster i mean i had everything so i figured okay instead of buying breakfast every morning and trying to figure out where to go for breakfast because there's really no fast food around where i'm at without walking quite a distance i just decided to hit the corner supermarket a couple of blocks up from the hotel and buy some groceries and i would just make breakfast every morning I mean, I had a coffee pot and a toaster. So I went grocery shopping and found out how expensive New York City really is, folks. For one loaf of bread, that was 18 ounces. That was sliced bread, $4.59. I can get a loaf of bread in Grand Rapids, Michigan, that's four ounces larger for half the price. That's how bad it is in New York City. Oh, it gets better, though. Four ninety nine dollars for a thing of orange juice, which is about the same price here in Grand Rapids. Five ninety nine dollars for a six-pack of the little cheeses that you unwrap that are wrapped in wax, the little round ones. I'm not going to mention any names, but I don't know what they are here in Grand Rapids. I believe they're less. Four fifty nine for a tub of spreadable butter, four ninety nine, basically five bucks for a dozen eggs, and the best one, I found some cinnamon apple muffins, and they looked really good. And I thought oh, I'll get these just in case I wake up late one morning and don't feel like cooking. For four muffins, eight dollars. It's bad over there, and then. One thing I will say that New York does that I really like, no plastic bags in New York, at least not at the grocery stores. You have to buy your own bag, and you can reuse it. At the place that I went to, their bag you can reuse about 125 times if their claim is correct. 19 cents I had to buy the bag for. But 
It was a small little grocery store with a little deli in it, and it was a cute store. But they had everything. They had everything you needed. Laundry detergent, vegetables, meat, cheese, you name it, they had it. So, yeah, that was really cool. Parking is not cheap in New York City either. $44 a day. I was there for six days. Uh, even though I got a $7 a day discount for staying at the hotel that I stayed at, you do the math, $222 for parking. <laughs> Oh, boy. Yeah, it was an expensive trip. Uh, we'll see if it's worth it. Uh, so I will keep you updated on my progress. And like I said, I am hoping that this is it. I am hoping that this helps. If it doesn't, they have offered a second round of treatments if I need it. Quite truthfully, the way I felt this week being back home, I do need it. I'm just going to tell you, folks, be honest with you, I really hate feeling depressed every single day of my life. I really do. I'm sick of it. And like I said, I just hope that this treatment works. They said there could be a delayed effect on it. They said it might not work right away. You know, I felt good, you know, but part of that could have been just the excitement of doing the trial the excitement of being in New York City for the first time, the excitement of traveling by myself for the first time in a very long time, a very long distance, and I got to see a lot of states. I stayed in Pennsylvania. I actually stayed in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area. Well, the original plan was I was hoping to get a hold of Christian at WLRI Radio in Pennsylvania. I believe there it's now WNUZ, if I remember the call letters correctly. But they're the Pacifica affiliate that covers Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And they've carried our former sister program, Women Libs Radio, back when that show was still being produced. So I was hoping to finally meet Christian in person, but unfortunately, with everything that I had going on, we never got together, and I left a message, and I was unable to get a hold of them. So we'll see how that goes. I also traveled to Knoxville, Tennessee, and met a Facebook friend in person for the first time. That was kind of cool to meet her. Wasn't expecting it. I thought she was out of town, but I then went to Martinsburg, West Virginia. Like I said, New York was awesome. Everybody that was there was just absolutely helpful and kind. I tell you what, I know that driving is <laughs> is a challenge in New York City. I experienced that on the day that I had the MRI or attempted to get the MRI and had the blood work drawn. Because by the time I had left the city, it was about 530 in the afternoon. And in order to get out of town, I was in a traffic jam for probably half an hour to 45 minutes before I was able to get out of the New Jersey turnpike. I also got to stop in New Jersey a couple of times and experience full-service gasoline because you're not allowed to pump your own gas in New Jersey, and apparently Oregon is now the same. So that'd be cool. It, it, it was a weird experience. It's like, okay, I haven't experienced full-service gasoline since I was a little kid in the 1970s. But that was also at about the time the self-serve was starting to get really popular everywhere. So it was it was a unique experience. I ended up meeting a friend of mine in Baltimore the weekend after the study finished up. We went to Sabatino's Italian Restaurant, made famous by the professional wrestlers of Jim Crockett Promotions and Jim Cornette talking about their good garlic bread there, which I had, and it's fantastic. So if you're ever in the Little Italy section of Baltimore, go to Sabatino's. <laughs> that, that's not a paid advertisement. That's just how I feel about the place. It's absolutely beautiful in there. While I was in Baltimore, we went to the National Aquarium. That was a cool place to check out, let me just tell you. Uh, I then left Baltimore, went back to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and back to Ranson, West Virginia. I've fallen in love with that town. And then on the way back to Michigan, I made a stop in Toledo and made a stop at Tony Paco's. 
Now, Tony Paco's is Hungarian hot dogs, made famous by Jamie Farr in his portrayal of Maxwell Klinger on MASH. So they've got a whole bunch of MASH memorabilia in there. Uh, they got a cardboard cutout of Jamie Farr dressed up as Klinger in a dress. The cardboard cutout also has Captain Hawkeye Pierce, Alan Alda. And I had to stop there. Um, it was it, That was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, of course, I had to send pictures to Katie J of me inside of Tony Paco's, so that was kind of cool. She She really enjoyed that. She had been there just a few months earlier, so... Yeah, so Hungarian hot dogs. The chili was way too hot. I can't handle hot food, but it was good, and it was nice to go back home. But I'm actually ready to go back out on the road again, and hopefully that happens soon. So, again, I will keep you updated on what happens with the study, how I feel after the treatment, if I need to have a second treatment, when that will take place, and we'll figure it out from there. And tell you what, let's go ahead and let's get into the show. As I've uh, wasted uh, pretty close to half an hour talking about my life and <laughs> my travels. Let's get to some updates to some stories that we have talked about in the past. Over the years, we have talked about unemployment in Michigan. Several years ago, one of our guests, Deb Fragel who is a unemployment insurance specialist, came on the show and told our listeners about Michigan's computer system that automated the unemployment system. So if the system recognized something that had a discrepancy, let's say that your employer said that you worked there for six months and you put down five months, the computer says that's a discrepancy and it will automatically deny you unemployment. It ju just little things like that. This has gone on for a number of years. People have been denied unemployment. People have gotten unemployment. Then we're told that they had to repay the unemployment. And if they didn't, they were going to go to jail. Well, we have railed on this system for a number of years. They, I think they finally got rid of it. By the way, this was the brainchild of former Governor Rick Snyder. You know, the tough nerd, or as I used to call him, the stuffed turd. I might have to dig out the Mr. Rogers music on him. <laughs> I don't know. But we have an update to this. This is Ed White writing for the Associated Press, dated October 20th, out of Detroit. Michigan lawmakers agreed to set aside $20 million to settle a lawsuit by thousands of people who were wrongfully accused of fraud when seeking unemployment benefits. The money was included in a larger bill recently signed into law by Governor Gretchen Whitmer. It follows an agreement reached by the Attorney General's office and lawyers for people who said their constitutional rights were violated. An automated computer system used during the administration of Governor Rick Snyder was a disaster. People were accused of cheating to get jobless aid. They were forced to repay money along with substantial penalties before the Unemployment Insurance Agency acknowledged widespread errors. Some victims filed for bankruptcy, lost wages, suffered poor credit ratings, and had trouble finding jobs because a lot of employers now they won't hire you until they pull a credit report. And if they see anything on there, which, by the way, I think that practice should be outlawed. And just like Michigan insurance companies use your credit rating to set the rate that you're going to get charged for your car insurance. And I think that's bullshit, too. And that needs to go away. It really does. You know, I did not realize this, but we did not have credit bureaus until uh, the credit scores didn't come about until about what 1986 88 somewhere in there you know i'll i'll tell you this story a lot of you know that i used to work for what is now chase bank at the time it was nbd national bank of detroit and through three different mergers it's now part of chase when i worked as a customer service representative for what was then nbd bank if somebody came in wanting to open a checking or savings account, 
The procedure was real simple. They would fill out paperwork and they would sign it, authorizing us to pull a check systems and credit report. So what check systems is, it's a private company, and I believe it used to be owned by Deluxe Check Printing. I don't think they own the company anymore. Check Systems is a reporting system that banks use to report individuals or companies who have closed accounts with outstanding balances, or they've bounced checks, or they have screwed the bank over somehow, quote-unquote screwed the bank. If you pass that, then you got a credit report done. Well, then people would ask, well, why, why do I need a credit report? Well, the bank's reasoning was, th this is the God honest truth. I don't know if this is still the case. I know it's not for the local bank that I go to. But ba again, back in the early 1990s when I worked for NBD Bank, the excuse to run the credit report was that we had to offer an ATM or a debit card with the account because you can withdraw money from an ATM if the system is down. That means that the bank is extending you credit in theory. You're able to pull money out of your ATM if you don't have the money in there. Therefore, it's an extension of credit issued by the bank Therefore, because they're issuing credit, they have to pull a credit report. And there have been customers that I have had to turn down for checking accounts because they had outstanding bills. You know, we, we overlooked hospital stuff. I will give credit there. But you know what? This goes back to something that Bernie Sanders talks about. Bernie Sanders, if he gets his way, would love to have the U.S. Postal Service get into the banking business. And this would help a lot of people who can't get traditional checking and savings accounts at their local banks or credit unions because of lawsuits, judgments, bad credit. It would help. So whenever Bernie Sanders talks about this topic, I want you to perk your ears up and help him out. Call Congress. Tell them that you want the Postal Service to get involved in banking to help these people that can't get their own accounts. It really would be a big benefit. I mean it. So that's the latest on the Michigan unemployment system. We now have another update. This is Madeline Burzma and Kyle Coons writing for Wood Television dated October 17th. This is an update about Former Michigan House Speaker Lee Chatfield. The Detroit News reports that Lee Chatfield, the former Michigan House Speaker, is under investigation. Records obtained by the paper say Attorney General Dana Nussel's office is investigating several alleged crimes related to the former Speaker. The Detroit News reports affidavits from this spring say Chatfield's brother got money from the Republicans' political accounts that he did not work for and they also accused the brother of giving Adderall to Chatfield and to lobbyists in Lansing several times. Adderall is a prescription drug that's used to treat ADHD and other things. I will tell you that people do crush up and snort Adderall to get high. So I'm not accusing anybody of that, but this looks pretty damn suspicious to me. There has been no response from the Attorney General's office on the investigation, so we, we will keep you updated on the latest happenings involving Lee Chatfield, we, which we've talked about before because Lee Chatfield has been accused by his sister-in-law of being sexually assaulted by him when she was a teenager. Let's go to our next story. This happened close to my hometown. This is Rachel Abramson writing for the Today Show and NBC News. This is dated October 18th out of Grant, Michigan, the onion capital of the world. I am not making this up, folks. A lot of your carrots and a lot of your onions come out of Grant, Michigan. A mural painted by a high school student came under fire when parents alleged it was promoting LGBTQ imagery and witchcraft. Oh, my God. 
Earlier this year, a Grant Michigan High School sophomore won a contest to brighten up the middle school health center. That's according to a statement from Grant Public Schools. The school system says the student received approval to paint images of smiling children as well as the message, stay healthy. In the painting, there are three children. A boy is seen in a light blue, pink, and white t-shirt, the colors of the transgender pride flag. A girl wears a pink, royal blue, and purple, the colors of the bisexual flag, and a second girl is in rainbow pride colors. Yeah, I can see this pissing off every single evil, violent, conservative traitor in Grant, and they come out of the woodwork there. Oh, boy. Grant Public Schools Superintendent Brett Zuver was a contest judge. He did not respond to an email asking if he understood the meaning of the colors when the student's design was chosen as the winner. Grant Public Schools said the final mural included some features that were not part of the agreement, including a demon face inspired by a popular video game called Genshin Impact and a Hamsa hand, also known as the Hand of Fatima or the Hand of Mary. The palm-shaped design has been a symbol for good luck or protection for centuries in many cultures, including Latin America. At a school board meeting on October 10th, parents accused the student artist of promoting witchcraft by including the Hamsa hand as well as the video game character that bears the likeness of a demon. Parents also objected to the use of LGBTQ colors. Of course they would, because there are a bunch of homophobes over there. There are a bunch of transphobes over there. I know these people. I've been around them for a long time, far too long. In footage captured at the meeting by ABC affiliate WZZM-TV, the student artist, with her voice breaking, said, quote, I put my art up there to make people feel welcome, end of quote. One man at the meeting called the mural hate material, and that is a direct quote. Another adult at the meeting said this, quote, I feel like she did a really good job finding excuses to defend the things you put on. None of us are that stupid, end of quote. No, actually you are over there. Go pick some onions. <laughs> Let me tell you what my high school used to do every year when we would play Grant in football and we would kick their ass every single year. We'd have an assembly in the high school and the coach and the players would get up and we'd have the pep rally and the students would take this big old onion and they'd pass it down the line. They'd take a bite out of it, pass it to the next guy, take a bite out of it and pass it all the way down the line. So that's Grant for you, folks. Tracy Hargreaves, who has two children in the Grant Public School System, came to the defense of the student artist. At the meeting, Hargreaves declared, quote, I am a conservative, right-wing, gun-loving American, and I've never seen more bigoted people in my life, end of quote. Wow, she's not going to get invited to any more Republican gatherings, I guarantee you that. Wow. In an interview with the Today Show, Hargreaves said, quote, the meeting turned into a hate fest. Usually there are 10 people at these meetings. 50 showed up. It wasn't even about the mural. People were talking about how we need to pray the gay away. I had to stand up and say something. It was out of control. You can't catch gay, honey. It's not contagious. End of quote. Hargreaves said that the student left the meeting in tears. The, the artist that created this mural. Hargreaves said, quote, she tried to explain herself, but no one would listen. They were convinced that the hand of Fatima was satanic, end of quote. Lori Donati, who works at the middle school health center where the mural is displayed, told NBC affiliate Wood Television earlier this month that she was thrilled with the result. Donati said, quote, everyone's accepted at our clinic. What she was trying to say is that everyone's accepted no matter what your background is or who you are. You are loved and accepted, and that's exactly our philosophy with our office, too. End of quote. On October 13th, Grant Public Schools announced that, quote, at the student artist requests, the mural will be returned to its original form as submitted originally and approved by the administration. End of quote. That means the images of the children and animals will remain, but symbols including the hand of Fatima and the video game character will be removed. The student artist's father declined an interview when contacted by the Today Show. 
Zuver, the school superintendent, said in an email that the student artist and the school board, quote, came to a very positive resolution, end of quote. No, it was a positive resolution for the school district, not for the student. This has Charleston, West Virginia smell all over it. It really does. Just go back to last week's episode when I talked about Caitlin Campbell and her fight against the school board there. Th this has this smell on it. It really does, folks. Zuver said, quote, she asked to make some adjustments by removing some of the items that were not on the original submission that was approved. There are some symbols that were used to fill in the space. She said the wall was bigger than she thought and didn't want to leave too many blank spaces. I am very proud of her. She is a great young lady, end of quote. No, you just taught her that adults want to have control over everything involving children and they don't want to listen to children. They need to be seen and not heard. And that's all there is to it. But again, like I said, it's Grant. What do you expect from them? A bunch of MAGA traders, because that's what you are. If you support MAGA, you're a fucking traitor. Bunch of homophobes, bunch of transphobes. You're hating people. You're not following that precious book that you so desire, the Bible. You cherry pick the goddamn thing and you don't follow it when you cherry pick it. Jesus Christ. Oh my God. I am so pissed. All right. Let, I tell you what, let's go ahead to our next segment here. Stop. Hammer time. Oh yeah. It's hammer time. It is time to drop the hammer on the douchebag of the week. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to be on fire this week on this segment. We have three winners for you. Winner number one, Pennsylvania Republican senatorial candidate, Dr. Mehmet Oz. Now, why am I going after Dr. Mehmet Oz? It's because Dr. Oz has been making fun of John Fetterman, his Democratic opponent, having a stroke. You don't believe me? This is an article that I pulled from August 30th, uh, written by Will McDuffie. Mehmet Oz, the Republican candidate for Senate in Pennsylvania on Tuesday, tried to distance himself from an AIDS comment last week that appeared to mock the stroke suffered by Oz's opponent, Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. Oz told KDKA Radio, quote, The campaign has been saying lots of things. My position, and I can only speak to what I'm saying, is that John Fetterman should be allowed to recover fully, and I will support his ability as someone who's gone through a difficult time to get ready, end of quote. Oz was responding to a question about a comment attributed to his communications advisor, Rachel Tripp, and I believe we have talked about Rachel Tripp on this show before. She was quoted as saying that if Fetterman, quote, had ever eaten a vegetable in his life, then maybe he wouldn't have had a major stroke and wouldn't be in the position of having to lie about it constantly, end of quote. Tripp's comment was first reported by Business Insider on August 23rd. Amid near-instant condemnation, including from pro-Fetterman doctors and Fetterman himself, Oz's campaign initially doubled down, calling the comment, quote, good health advice, end of quote, from a former cardiothoracic surgeon. Until Tuesday morning, Oz had yet to personally speak about the campaign's comment. A spokesperson did not respond to repeated requests from ABC News to speak to the candidate after a town hall Monday outside of Pittsburgh, even as Oz criticized Fetterman for dodging the press at campaign stops of his own. The spokesperson, Brittany Yannick, and this Rachel Tripp also did not immediately respond to requests for comment on Tuesday. You know what? If you make fun of somebody having a stroke or has had a stroke, you're an asshole. Plain and simple. There is no excuse for it. There is zero excuse for it. I'll tell you this. Strokes happen for a myriad of reasons. It's not just diet related. No, it isn't. There are other underlying health issues that cause this. This is what you get with conservatives. Look, hell, look at Donald Trump. He made fun of a disabled reporter. That should have ended his presidential campaign. And it didn't, though. It didn't. Because conservatives are hate-filled people. Period. End of story. And I tell you what, the more that I have to deal with conservatives, the more that I have to listen to them, the more hate I feel in my heart. 
I am really sick of these people. You know, we always say on this show, punch a Nazi in the face. No, I'm to the point now, punch a conservative in the face. They deserve it. They have it coming to them. I swear to God. Winner number one, Dr. Mehmet Oz. Winner number two, Kent County Commissioner Monica Sparks, who supposedly is a Democrat, but she isn't. She was a Republican delegate to their convention up until the day after she won the Democratic primary to become county commissioner. She is a conservative. She is a MAGA conservative. Why is she get douchebag of the week? Not only for being a fake Democrat and the fake Democrats to support her, like Skaggs, Phil Skaggs, the other county commissioner that's now running for state house which by the way we're not endorsing a candidate in that race i guarantee you why monica sparks cut a video for the catholic diocese of lansing calling on people to vote no on proposal three which would guarantee abortion rights in the state of michigan you don't believe it here's the audio my name is Monica Sparks. I am a Kent County Commissioner and a proud Democrat, and I will not be voting for Proposal 3 because it is rooted in genocide, racism, and eugenics. I'm pro-life because, to me, it's the right thing to do. Uh, I am a product of the foster care system. I was in foster care system with my identical twin sister, and I tell you, that was not a great time in my life. I don't know where I would be without my forever family or my identical twin sister. Um, I just feel so blessed to have them. And I know that based on them having us, that life is precious. And they saved our life. They saved our life. And we're worth saving. We're, 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 we're worth saving and the vulnerable among us are worth saving as well. They need our support. Look at, you know, the whole history of abortion. We're looking at eugenics, we're looking at genocide. Anytime you say that someone does not deserve to live because they're feeble, they're weak-minded individuals, what are you saying about the human race? The last I checked, we all bleed red. I believe they put a big blanket over it and say abortion is health care. The last I checked, health care does not end lives. Health care helps to continue life. And we need real health care, real solutions, real changes so that the African American community can be empowered. We're not empowered right now. And this is not going to empower us anymore. What is your opinion of? Proposal I personally will not be voting for it because I am a Democrat and I am a whole life Democrat. There are one in three Democrats that are pro-life and I stand with the 21 million in the country and I will keep standing with them to make sure that I protect the least among us, the most vulnerable. What are the potential political consequences for you in being so outspoken and being so brave? Now, I'm running unopposed this term, but next term, I, they could be coming for me. And you know what? It's okay, because I'm speaking the truth. The truth is what matters to me. I'm. I'm absolutely happy to be serving as a servant leader in my role as a county commissioner but I'm happier when I can be me to speak the truth. Monica Sparks is a dino, Democrat in name only. And I'm once again going to call on the Democratic Party to purge all the pro-lifers out of the party permanently forever. You need to do it now. Big Tent doesn't work. Big Tent is bullshit. Like I said, I'm at the point now, I don't care if I lose listeners. I don't care if I lose donors. I don't care if I lose patrons. I don't care if I lose radio stations. I'm going to speak the truth. And if it bothers you, then maybe you need to look in the mirror 
and find out why it bothers you that I'm telling the truth. So winner number two, Monica Sparks. Winner number three, the CEO of Spartan Nash, Tony Sarsom. Let me explain Spartan Nash. Spartan Nash is a grocer based out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. They not only supply other grocery stores, they own their own chains across the Midwest and into the breadbasket of the country. In the Grand Rapids, West Michigan area, they own d they own Family Fair, and they own Forest Hills Foods. So why am I going after Tony Sarsom? Here's why. I was tipped off to this on Reddit of all places. So this was posted to the Grand Rapids subreddit. Headline reads, Spartan Nash CEO sent out a company-wide email essentially urging employees to vote against Proposal 3. Spartan Nash is a publicly traded company. So this is an internal email that was sent out company-wide to every employee, and I'm going to read it in its entirety, at least the screenshot that was posted to the Grand Rapids subreddit. A message from Tony Sarsom, CEO. Dear Spartan Nash Associates in Michigan, with We Serve as one of our core behaviors, one of the most important ways we can serve the company and the communities in which we live and work is by exercising our civic duty to vote. I encourage all associates to do three things related to the upcoming election on November 8th. One, make a plan. Whether you are voting early via an absentee ballot or voting in person on election day, make sure to carve out time in your day to fulfill this civic duty. Election results affect all of us as individuals, but it also affects us as parents, as workers, as employers, and as members of a broader community. Two, do your research. In many states, voting in this election cycle will involve voting for more than just candidates. Several states, including Michigan, where our Grand Rapids Service Center, Distribution Center, and several of our stores are located, have ballot proposals that voters will need to consider too. Don't assume that proposals can be understood easily on the ballot. These ballots use oversimplified summary language that do not fully explain all that the proposal entails. I encourage you to consult resources like ballotpedia.org forward slash sample underscore ballot underscore lookup, where you can obtain a sample ballot and research candidates and proposals. Let me add, you can also get that on the Michigan Secretary of State website by going to the area that involves elections. You put in your address, you will get the sample ballot right for your area. Let me continue. Sites like this allow you to read the actual language of proposals before you get to the voting booth. This site also provides sample arguments for and against some of the proposals and often includes details about the funding behind the candidates and proposals. Challenge yourself to read and consider both sides of the argument for or against each proposal. Three, think critically. It is our responsibility as voters to use our own judgment when we fulfill our civic duty and vote. It's important to wade through political propaganda and think critically about the independent research you have conducted. In Michigan, for example, there are three ballot proposals that, if passed, will permanently change the Michigan Constitution, creating implications beyond a single election cycle. Now, I'm fine with that. It's the next two sentences that were highlighted by this Reddit user that posted this, and this is where I have my issues. As previously mentioned, proposal language isn't always clear and can be overly broad, which is likely to result in litigation at taxpayers' expense. For example, one of the proposals, if adopted, would significantly infringe on parental rights, but it isn't being marketed as such. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's being marketed as something else, but it infringes on rights of the parents. <laughs> Bullshit. He's talking about Prop 3. It is total bullshit. There is no argument about it. It's not being marketed by one thing and another. It's not. 
It's not a confusing proposal. Tony Sarsom is bought into the lies and the bullshit from the right because he's a pro-lifer, more than likely, my opinion. Let me finish. He says, so ask yourself, is this particular proposal good for you as an individual, for your family, your children, your place of work, and your community? What rights are you gaining through these proposals, and which rights are you losing? Read every word to ensure you're making an informed decision. Here's my problem with it. When you start telling people in a passive-aggressive way, oh, you need to vote against Prop 3, no, you are now interfering with somebody's voting. That's voter intimidation in the state of Michigan, and you can go to prison for it, especially as an employer. Employers ought to know better than to engage in this. He would have been fine if he said, go vote, period, full stop. I would agree with that. When he threw in that little remark about Prop 3, that's where I have an issue with. When I posted Tony Sarsom's email to my Facebook page with a call to boycotts, Barton Nash, I actually got into an argument with a friend who happens to know Tony Sarsom. And I was told that I overreacted, that I didn't know Tony Sarsom, and didn't know the intent behind his message. I was also told to shut the f*** up. Well, this person was right on one thing. I don't know Tony Sarsom, which makes my point even more clearer. He shouldn't have posted what he did. He should have stopped at go vote, period, full stop. Anything after that was a mistake on his part. And now there's blowback against Barton Nash. Quite truthfully, rightfully so. This friend later apologized after cooler heads prevailed. And even though I accepted the apology, it still doesn't change that I was told to shut the f*** up and that I overreacted. Number one, I didn't overreact. And number two, I have every right as a journalist and as a commentator to talk about this. So I am never going to shut the f*** up about this or anything else. And if anybody doesn't like it, they can stop listening to the show, period. People don't understand, including some of my longtime friends, don't understand the amount of bullying that I have had to put up with over the years. Well, it's going to end. I'm not going to put up with it because at the end of the day, here's the deal. I do not have to subject myself to all the bullshit, criticism, or anything else. I can stop this show and I can walk away forever. So to the triad of assholes this week, we have this message for you. Don't be a douchebag. Yeah, you got that right. I swear to God, everybody needs to stop being a douchebag. Quit going after people that are on your side. Quit standing up for rich people. Rich people don't give a f about you. Like Carlin said, the sooner you figure that out, the better. So before you open your mouth to criticize me, you better step in my shoes. Just one time. Maybe some of you will get it. Finally. That's going to do it for this week. I'm Darren Gibson. Please support independent media, the First Amendment, and most importantly, a woman's right to choose. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.